Today, I'm speaking to Dr. Aisha Jahenga, who is a writer and academic currently based in Australia. Dr. Jahenga specializes in peace journalism and digital war, online extremism and justice. She has also worked as a journalist in Afghanistan and Pakistan, and she's currently writing a book about Afghan refugees and media discourses of war and conflict, which was also the topic of her PhD thesis. International media coverage has long presented Afghan women as victims of the Taliban who have to be saved. But the images that we are seeing of the women's protests that have continued to take place in Afghanistan after the US and its allies evacuated seem to tell us a different story. As someone who has studied Afghan women and the media and who has worked as a journalist in Afghanistan, what do you have to say about this? Uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Peter, for having me on the podcast. I would like to uh, start with the acknowledgement of the country. Uh, I want to let you know that I am uh, connecting with you from the land of the Dharawal people, and I uh, want to pay my respects to the traditional uh, owners, past, present, and emerging. And I also acknowledge that the sovereignty of this land was never ceded. Um, thank you for that question. Uh, it has been coming up um, over social media as well. Uh, and journalists have also been raising these concerns. But I want to first let you, um, want to take you back in 2004 and, uh, uh, and the new Afghan constitution that of course is now um, not um, uh, in, in, in uh, uh, you know, function anymore in the government. Um, so 27, under the constitution, 27% of the 250 seats in the house of the people were reserved for women. So, and we know that the overall situation of Afghan women had significantly improved um, during the 2000s and, and later, particularly in uh, major urban areas, but those uh, living in rural part of the country still faced many problems. So the big question that journalists and, uh, and people around the world are raising right now is that, um, is it that bad under the Taliban government for women? Can we trust the Taliban on women's rights? Um, as, an, as an academic, as a researcher who's, who's looking at this area, my simple answer would be no. And also that the, that the women who are coming out on, onto the streets, first of all, I want to um, acknowledge that these have to be some of the bravest, most brave women um, on the face of the earth right now to be, to be standing in the face of such an uncertain future uh, and a ruthless, ruthless um, 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 enemy of, of not only the state and of course people as well. So it is clear from the stance and the actions of the Taliban uh, over the last few weeks that women are not safe in Afghanistan. Um, women have been banned from many offices, including television. Uh, they've been, um, uh, the education has been segregated. And in many cases, they have been told that only women can teach young girls. And I want to remind you that, um, which means that we want more women teachers and we want more women educators and there are not enough of them. Taliban leaders have offered um, a somewhat gentler rhetoric on women's rights in the first few weeks, but there is still a major disconnect between what they said in their TV interviews and what they are doing on the ground. Um, where their commanders are enforcing um, even harsher methods to treat these women and deal with these women, um, uh, um, charging them with, with batons and, and, and uh, hitting them and pushing them and, 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 and literally threatening them with, with uh, being shot at sight. Um, so now it has become a matter of mere survival as these women and their families are at risk of not only being forced away from, from the public, but also starvation. Um, so, so yeah, just because there are some women on streets does not account for the situation in Afghanistan uh, uh, that it is any better or freer for women on ground. One of the placards that was carried in one of these women's protests in Afghanistan recently said, we are not women of the 90s. What do you understand this to mean? Well, I clearly see that this message speaks of their resilience and the extent that they're willing to go to defend their rights 
and not being dragged back into into in time, um, the 90s for that matter, um, and resist the system that is exclusively dominated by warlords and tribal ed elders who have, as we know, no regard for women, their needs and their rights. Um, so the concern now is that is not that of the marginalization of women. It is about being pushed to the margin so hard that they ultimately disappear from the public discourse and public sphere ultimately. Yes, there are some rural women who do not feel connected to such um, urban women or elite women, if I can call that, um, nor do these women in rural areas believe that these women necessarily speak for them. But I want to remind you that these women who are, um, who are in these rural areas um, have opened their eyes in a system that never spoke to them, never spoke for them. And these women who are on the roads carrying these placards, um, not resisting and telling face to face these Taliban and other uh, allies of Taliban that we are not those women who you could shun, push to the margins. We are stronger. We know our rights more. We understand what role we can play in the society and have been playing over the last 20 years, gradually improving uh, their presence in society. Um, so these brave women representatives who are out on the roads, putting their lives literally in the line of fire carries sufficient weight for the present and future of women and young girls in Afghanistan. Some of the women protesters have chanted slogans attacking Pakistan. Can you explain this? Uh, we all know uh, the role that Pakistan has played um, uh, in, in, the, in, in previous wars in Afghanistan and, uh, uh, and now as well. We, uh, it is not a hidden fact that Pakistan is one of the allies of the Taliban. Um, we also know the involvement of the Pakistani um, intelligence spy agency, the ISI, in, 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 uh, in um, aiding uh, the takeover, Taliban takeover. And we know that there are lots of regional politics involved to it, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, having a strong hold within the region, uh, specifically because how Pakistan, Pakistan's relationships have been with India, and how Afghanistan has been um, getting closer to India over the last um, 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 two decades uh, or, um, uh, or less. So, um, and we have seen there have been protests in front of the Pakistani embassy in, pa in, in Kabul um, and in other regions as well of asking Pakistan to stop its alleged um, involvement in uh, bringing Taliban into power and, and interfering in, in its um, state matters uh, and also not regarding, so basically disregarding the rights of women. We had uh, the Pakistani prime minister uh, recently, in fact, just a couple of days uh, in an interview with, this, uh, to, with CNN um, um, express his um, ignorance of the fact um, uh, that how these women are, are, are facing these challenges and, and, and suffering and how bleak their future is in the country by saying that it is part of Afghanistan's internal matter and we must not interfere and uh, not we as in the international, um, 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 uh, you know, uh, international um, systems should not interfere and then let the Taliban handle women in their own context. I, I see this, I condemn it and I see it as an ignorance and an, an apathetic comment or a stance uh, which lacks compassion for the women of the region, because this is not just the problem of, of Afghan women under, 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 under Taliban rule. Uh, this is the problem of women in any dictatorial uh, government that is, that is um, specifically um, uh, promoted or, or based on religion for that matter. So the reason they have been chanting slogans against Pakistan, or the reason there has been this hashtag trending online on social media, specifically Twitter, hashtag sanction Pakistan, is not for because there is some personal hate for the country or its people. It's because they are resisting interference. I, I personally find 
most of the comments uh, by the Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan problematic, um, um, in, um, um, drenched in internalized patriarchy and misogyny, uh, and also the love for power. Um, um, and I'm sure that a lot of people uh, will, will, will not like me for saying that, but as a researcher, I can only mention the facts. And, and I, when I say this, I, uh, I'm basing my opinion on, uh, on, re on evidence. So um, we all know that his comments or his stance on how women should live and how women should become part of society are even in Pakistan are quite problematic. We must not forget that recently um, he was engaging in, um, uh, in, in rape apologia, um, um, victim blaming directly or indirectly. Um, the fact that uh, 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 he, he called, he, did, he, he had been given comments on how women should dress. And um, I think that he, and the likes of him look at this from a very narrow and a very petty angle, uh, which is which is not inclusive of, uh, of 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 the rights of women. Not only because for the way that they want to dress up, that is not the biggest problem of women in this region. The biggest problem of the, of of, of uh, women in this region is inequality, oppression, domestic violence. Um, you name it, they have it, you know, in Pakistan and in Afghanistan and this region, we've got starving widows. We have underage girls that are forced into marriage. We have high maternal death rates, rape, murder, incest, abductions, wife beatings, uh, marital rape, self-immolation, deprivation of education, burning uh, of girls' schools, restricted mobility. And of course, our cherry on the top is forcing them uh, to wear the burqa or hide uh, their bodies um, uh, or, or, or associating the honor, quote unquote, with, with women. So yes, this, 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 they're, they're, the, these problems are on an inter intersectional level um, and need a deeper analysis and self-reflection into how we uh, look at these and deal with these problems. Since the US and its allies started leaving, uh, evacuating uh, from Afghanistan, um, there have been uh, many demonstrations uh, organized by members of the Afghan community in countries like Australia that have taken up the question of the rights of women in Afghanistan. Can you explain uh, the interaction between these refugee communities that have settled um, outside Afghanistan on uh, the, the movement for women's rights in Afghanistan today? Um, that's very interesting. Um, one of the research papers that I'm working on right now is um, assessing the ways and methods that Afghan um, um, uh, communities in Australia uh, from the Afghan diaspora, diaspora communities are using uh, and the strategies are using to, um, uh, to, to stand up for the rights of people back in Afghanistan and, and specifically also uh, women as well through digital activism. Um, there are a handful of women, yes, but again, uh, the way this entire war or conflict and relationship between Pakistan and Afghanistan is reflected and portrayed in media has a lot of influence on how people feel towards each other. Um, I, as a Pakistani Pashtun woman uh, living in Australia, I am always welcomed into uh, these groups on social media. I have some of some of my very close friends are Afghan, um, Afghan uh, men and women who are either in Afghanistan right now or in other parts of the country um, or, or the world. So coming back to your specific questions about how they, yes, they, they are, but again, there are some restrictions again of, they need to know, they need to, they want to do it, but they don't know how to do it. And the problem is also of accessing and getting in touch with people back in, in, in Afghanistan uh, because of their restric restricted mobility, um, and access to internet as well. Um, we saw that there have been, uh, uh, Australia has uh, 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 welcomed over 3000 um, Afghan refugees um, and people with valid visas into Pakistan, uh, into Australia. But as, as, as part of the um, activist members and community here, I would 
really, really hope that Australia opens its heart and and and, and welcomes more, more, more people from that. And and the Afghan diaspora here are are, are waiting and 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 hoping that they could make some contribution into the lives of these people who have just been welcomed. Uh, for instance, um, offering foster care for Afghan um, children who have arrived uh, without their families uh, and for women who have arrived without um, support or um, uh, as families. So um, it's just the start, um, but yes, they, they, their spirits are high and the connection with their homeland is displayed at its best, um, specifically in the times of uh, crisis and conflict like this. One of the historical questions uh, is the role that education reforms, reforms to include more women in education, um, particularly those who, that were introduced after the 1978 Sour Revolution in Afghanistan. What role did these reforms have on subsequent political developments? And are there lessons that should or can be drawn from that experience for the broader struggle of women's rights in Afghanistan and in the region? Yeah, I think that's a very substantial question because it's very important for us to know the history to be able to understand what's happening now and where can it lead us in the future. So I'll just remind um, the listeners about one of the Taliban's first acts after they swept into power in Afghanistan um, about a month ago was to force most women out of their jobs and into their homes and I've all. So let me take you back um, a few years ago. So the idea that Afghan women should be considered full contributing members of society beyond their home was first declared by during the reign of uh, the Emir, uh, Amir Habibullah. Um, so what Habibullah believed was that Islam does not deny women um, the right to education and that it is an, that is, is an Islamic duty of the men to provide women with the opportunity to function fully in the society. You are saying this is, this is in what period of time? Um, so this is uh, the early, um, um, it's, 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 it's during the 19th hundreds, early 1900s. So I'm taking you back about 100 years ago. Um, so Habibullah believed that Islam does not. And so therefore, having women only in the home would not benefit Afghanistan as the whole. So the reason I'm referring back to the time around about 100 years ago under Amir Habibullah is that Afghan, Afghans do not see women as some alien part that needs to be kept inside the home. They do believe under Islamic laws and values that women would, that, that a country cannot benefit as a whole unless women become an equal part of a society. Now coming to um, uh, 1978, uh, the Sour Revolution that you mentioned when it took place through which Afghan communists, the Soviet backed People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan seized power in a coup and killed President Dawood and his family in the presidential palace. Now, in during this, this, this um, time, after the Afghan Communist Party revolution, women again became a strong part of the working society in big cities. Now, so it, the, 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 this, this, this need for women to become part of society is, is old, it's not new. Um, so it, it's not that it happened just in, in, in the last 20 years. Um, so the new regime, after, the, after 1978, what they did is through its women's organization announced the launch of an aspirational literacy campaign. So more than 18,000 people were recruited as instructors because they planned to eliminate literacy within one year, sorry, illiteracy within one year. Now in reality, however, this campaign was mostly based in bigger cities like Kabul or Mazar Sharif or even parts of Kandahar. Uh, and the content of, this, um, of these new textbooks reflected true Marxist doctrine. So, so the change started happening. Women started getting to know. There were women who came out and, and started getting uh, uh, active in society. Uh, but unfortunately in the early 1980s, uh, with the direct Soviet Union's invasion of Afghanistan, women 
issues in general again took a secondary place in the agenda of the regime. Um, Islamist um, uh, uh, Afghan parties um, started to mobilize and gain substantial power around the country. And we, we all know what take do they have on women's rights and education. So now women in Afghanistan are worried once again. Things had started to become a bit better as I started my interview by reminding um, the listeners about uh, the, 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 the representation that women had in the parliament and in the government uh, and considered as equal members of the society under the constitution. So things had started becoming better. Uh, they were you know, getting education, they were going out, they were getting uh, um, um, uh, exposed to, to, to history, to politics, to society. Um, and so now women in Afghanistan are worried because a peace deal with Taliban or acknowledgement of the government under Taliban by its allies or other countries means putting women aside. That is clear into the abyss. There is no second point thought about it. You can't say, no, let's give them a chance. They will get better. No, they will not because that is not how their ideology works. Their values that they run on are, do not consider women as equal by society. So we know that they have in their previous rule fl flogged women, cut their noses off to represent a loss of honor. Uh, they've also stoned women to death. So after 20 years of one, women have come back to where they had started from. And this brings, takes me back to, again, 100 years ago under Habibullah's regime, where, where there needs to be an acknowledgement, not only in Afghanistan, but in that region, that women are humans and that their rights and their needs matter as much as those of men. I understand that different countries and different cult have different cultures, they have their own ways of lifestyle. Um, it, they can choose to cover themselves. They can choose not to cover themselves. But the debate is not just about women not wanting to cover themselves. No, Afghan women do not want to uncover themselves or, or because that is not how the society or the culture works. What they want is to be acknowledged as humans, acknowledged as an equal member of the society, being given a part in the social fabric, the social sphere, public narrative, and not being shunned to the side for ultimate um, evaporation of, 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 and that is where we've come from. So I would like to end this response on um, Gandhi's uh, very famous quote. And he says that your beliefs become your thoughts, your thoughts become your words. Your words become your actions. Your actions become your habits. And your habits become your values. And ultimately your values become your destiny. So now is a question of values. And of course, habits and actions and words and thoughts. So it all starts from that little thought of considering empathy and considering understanding and tolerance and just acknowledging their existence, the existence of women.